If your word is true, they aren't stories, they're histories. It's not a, it's not a time and place, God, that I don't believe your word. Help us to wring everything out of your word. We, we're desperate seeking your word. We're desperate and hoping for your word. We're desperate in believing. Uh, God, like that song that we, that we know, it says, I'm desperate in believing that the sight of your face is all that I need. I'm desperate in believing that. God, show up tonight, please, so that something makes sense. And we change. And we grow. And when we leave here, we know you a little better and the plan for our lives a little better. Please, that's what we ask. That's what we desire. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Before we read verse 1 of, of chapter 13, uh, I've got to let you guys know that every once in a while in Scripture, you'll hear me say, scribe error. You have two scribe errors in this chapter. Both of them occur in a place where they're doing is what's called numerical value system. Hebrew is written so that every letter ascribes a number to it. And the way that they used to know that the, the Hebrew scripture was kept pure and undefiled, was perfect in the original form, was every single line, that's what the, the Lord Jesus called every jot and tittle, every line had a specific numerical value. But some numbers and letters look a lot alike. And when it was scribed over into the Latin Vulgate, and when it was scribed over into the English especially, there was mistakes. For instance, line 1, verse 1, chapter 13, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. Now, some would say Saul reigned 40 years. As a matter of fact, who has an uh, 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 NIV here? What does the NIV read? 42 years, right? The numbers and the letters look so... That's why the, the NIV took some liberties that the New King James and the NASB didn't take. They tried to stick to verbatim, but more accurate in this would be what the NIV says, that Saul had reigned 42 years in Israel. He was the king for 40 years. However, in his second year, these are some of the things that happened. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? If you have questions about that, let me know. Um, don't let that shake your faith because the, out of all the scribe errors in scriptures, and there's a handful of them, none of them change the text, meaning, or understanding even a little. Okay? Imagine if it was one year, it wouldn't matter. It doesn't change anything about who Christ is and what he's done. Amen? Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. Now, just as, uh, just as Samuel told, him, told the people, when you appoint a king, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to go around to your towns and your villages, he's going to and he's going to take the best men for himself. He's going to take your sons and your daughters, so forth and so on. What you're about to see in the next couple of chapters is the descent of Saul from a place of humility and awe of what God's done to a place of arrogance, to a place of thinking he knows better, you're about to see the descent of Saul. Plus, you're also about to see, and this is the hardest thing, guys, and this is, for me, what I've noticed in ministry. Some people do everything right, but their heart is just never there. Some people do everything that Scripture says, and yet there's something, and, and you often wonder, why doesn't this person get it? And they lack one thing. Brokenness. We just sang, brokenness, brokenness is what... I could sit here and tell you honestly, completely, that I am a piece of garbage. I am nothing. I am less than zero. I have accomplished nothing. I am nothing. I stand before you and honestly tell you I am a broken, completely waste of a human being without Christ. Amen. Add Christ into my life and something 
miraculous happens. I become almost responsible. I become almost respectable. I, 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 I become almost something you can admire. But never, ever, ever, ever do I think beyond that. And that's one common thread that you're going to see in the next two, two chapters of looking at Saul. And it's also something you need to continually look at yourself about. The Bible completely says, examine yourself. And please remember, you came to church to change. And when pastor says something you don't like, or scripture says something that pokes you, don't be surprised. That's why we're all here, guys. That's why we're here. Now, there are a lot of good churches around where they're going to give you a nice sugar, sugar-coated message. And if you get the message, well, praise God. And if you don't, well, that's okay too. Maybe next week. That ain't us. And Lord willing, unless he changes, that ain't never going to be. I'm going to hammer this message home because this is how God worked on me and in me. And looking at the people that God's placed around me in my life, I'd say God's done that good work. And I believe in God's good work. You with me? Yes. Continuing. Now notice the first thing is, 1,000 men were with Jonathan. We haven't introduced you to Jonathan yet. Jonathan is one of Saul's sons. Happens to be just the opposite of Saul. Same exact man. He does what's right for the right reason. Saul does what's right for the wrong reason. You're about to see this illustrated. The rest of the people he sent away every man to his tent. And verse 3, Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Again, give me your attention. Jonathan saw a garrison, saw a stronghold, saw a small detachment where people had settled and said, man, the Philistines are there. The Philistines were the eternal enemies. The Philistines in in Scripture are a type of the world. They're a type of um, what is everything going to be against you. They were the eternal enemy of the Israelites. He saw it. He attacked it. He took it. But what happened was, when word got through the rest of the nation of the Philistines that the Israelites had conquered a Philistine um, citadel, they freaked out. And they uproared. And they were now, all the Philistines hated the Hebrews. Well, are you going to let fear grip you? Or are you going to stand up and know that God's fighting your battles? That's the question you'd ask the Israelites. Verse 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. Now, it must be the same scribe that screwed the first (laughs) sentence up because he screwed this one up too. What does the NIV say on this one? 3,000. 3,000, yeah. 3,000 is more likely because it's going to be really tough to have 30,000 but only only 6,000 horsemen. It's going to be really tough to to ride 30,000 chariots or only 6,000. So 3,000 with two men per makes 6,000. A little makes a little more sense. Again, scribal error. Don't discount scripture because of that. And the people, as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude, and they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed. Give me your attention. They stood up and roared and said, God has given us great deliverance. Yes, that's what we're going to do. We will raise up our swords and spears and and we will fight against the Philistines. No, that's not what happened. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Man... I wish I can, it's like the thing I was talking about at the beginning of the service, guys. I wish I can be mad. I wish I could look at the Israelites and say, you bumbling idiots. What is wrong with you? But this is me. All of the things that God has done in my life for the last 20 years. I was looking at my baptismal certificate and I just realized, wow, it's almost 20 years since I've been baptized. And yet, Every time something happens, there I am. What's God going to do? Oh my God. Worry this and worry. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? 
How many times does God have to tell you, I have not taken you this far to drop you. I have not taken you this far to let you go now. Some of the Hebrews even crossed over the Jordan. They were like, we're out, goodbye. We should have stayed over there with them anyway. Remember, you guys remember that two, two of the tribes stayed on one side of the Jordan? As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Give me your attention again. He says, I want you to go to Gilgal. Samuel says, wait for me at Gilgal. I'll be there in seven days. Seven days go by. He's got all these freaking out people. The Philistines are about to attack. He does something. He does something that at first glance you would think, what's the big deal? But listen to me. Don't ever get too chummy with the Lord. To me, very rarely will you hear me say Jesus. Very rarely. To me, it's the Lord Jesus. To me, it's my King. It's my Savior. It's my God. I don't get too chummy with Him. And I don't take His holiness for granted. Holiness, even like the song we were singing, holiness, holiness. There is a time to shed things in your life. Look at what happens here. Verse 9, So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he presented the burnt offering that Samuel, then that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. He, not being a priest, decided he wasn't going to wait for the sacrifice and went out and did it himself. Like, big deal. I mean, what's the big deal? Samuel, maybe Samuel got killed on the way. Maybe he got taken by the Philistines. Somebody had to offer the sacrifice. Be careful. Be careful. Don't ever take for granted the holiness of God. There is a set order, and each one of us have our place in the kingdom. Nobody is more important. Nobody is different in importance, but we are different in performance. You do what you're called to do. You do what you've been told to do. Be very, very careful. He was the king. He was not the priest. And according to Levitical law, he was not to be offering sacrifices. Are you understanding me? I read the same thing, guys. I read and I go, big deal. He offered the sacrifice. He went out to meet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you didn't come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Sounds like a good excuse. I was afraid. I was afraid you weren't going to get here. I was afraid. I haven't made my supplication to the Lord. I didn't ask Him for victory, and I don't want to do that. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason. You understand me? Saul said, when I saw that the people... I read that. Verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord saw for Himself a man after His own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over His people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Give me your attention. 41 years the man reigned. After two years, he was declared not the king anymore. This is insane that God let him stay in office for 38 years. You with me? To me, this is astounding. When you see what happens there, and it's like, well, then why would God allow, why would God choose this man knowing he was going to mess up? It's exactly what we've been talking about. Sometimes you got to go through the fire to really enjoy. My kids think that cold weather is 30 degrees. We go up to the cabin in Georgia and they thought, man, it was 35, 40. Ooh, it's cold. I like it, Daddy. I like it. I said, this isn't cold. Oh, it's cold. We like cold. We like cold weather. So a few days later, we drove to the top of this mountain up there and I was looking at the the temperature, the thermometer thing on my car said 22, 18, 15, 11, 9. I said, this is cold. 
let's go for a hike. Yay, I like cold weather. We went out there in that cold weather. How many of you all from up north know what cold weather is? Hmm? When you first start to burn us, and you breathe in the air and it hurts your lungs. <laughs> I don't like cold weather. You want to go back in the car now? Yeah. You going to ever say I like cold weather again? No. No. Start to appreciate what you got. I moved down to Florida in 88, July of 88. And because I spent my first 20 some odd years in New York, 25 almost years in New York, I really appreciate Florida. To me, living in Florida is like living in a color movie. And going up to New York, it's like being in a black and white movie. Especially if you've ever been in New York in, in December and January, there's no black and white. There's just gray. Even the snow is gray. It's cold and miserable. And everywhere it looks like there's dragons everywhere. There's dragons everywhere. Every time you breathe, they <laughs> Ooh, just thinking about it, it's giving me chills. I hate cold weather. So maybe that's why God let them have Samuel, um, Saul for 40 years. Just to let them know. It's funny how he did 40 years. He let them run in the desert for 40 years. It's an interesting number, that 40, but that's a completely different study. Verse 15, Then Samuel rose, went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, and so numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Now I want you also to notice it didn't say he fell on his face and begged for forgiveness. He said, please pray for me. He didn't say anything like that. He was like, well, I guess life sucks for me from now on. He looked and he said, I'm the king. I've got thousands of men. Oh, well. Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned on the road to Orphra, the other, uh, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road of Beth Haran. Another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock, his axe, his sickle. And the charge for sharpening was a pim for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes, and to set the points of the goads. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Give me your attention. Finally, the Philistines, they set themselves in three companies. They start to descend on the Israelites. The Israelites now, 3,000 of them against how many thousands? It says the sand. There was just 6,000 men and horses and 3,000 chariots. And then people... And to make matters worse, the Philistines some years ago, after they defeated Israel, they decided that the Israelites were not allowed to have any metal tools. If they had a metal tool, it would have to be sharpened by the Philistines. They'd have to go down to the Philistines, they'd have to pay them, and they'd sharpen their axe, they'd sharpen their sickle, but not for weaponry, only for agricultural. You understand what's going on here? So now being a part of 3,000, looking over at maybe 15 or 20,000, and you have a stick in your hand. But it's okay, though, because Saul and his son Jonathan, they have a sword. Ours are pretty stacked up against you. Anybody ever feel like that? <laughs> Anybody ever feel like that? When you're getting phone calls from the bill collectors? About to turn your phone off, water, electricity. And they're so strong and they're so powerful. It's the worst thing in the world. I mean, for some people, it's not quite even as bad. I mean, if you've ever been late, I was just late on a payment. I, ch I switched banks. I was late on a payment for my mortgage. Called up. They charged me 200 bucks. I was like, no, no, no. I called them up. Come on. And, and, and what happened was I, I have a new bank and, and I, I set it on auto pay, but they didn't send it out. They made a mark against my credit. 
They told me the payment was late. I called them up. I'll make the whole payment now. They don't care. Well, can you take away the, can you take away the late fee? No. That's, that's not fair. That's not fair. Who gave you so much power? Did you put a mark against my credit? I'm just trying to build my credit back up. Ordered a new phone line. I didn't like the phone line they sent me. So I called up DirecTV. I bundled it. Saved me $50 a month. They call AT&T because they're working with AT&T. AT&T says you can't have the phone. This one says you can't have the phone. They send somebody out. He doesn't have the right order. And I can't get nobody on the phone. Everybody I call is from India or someplace like that. <laughs> like, this ain't fair. This ain't fair. Now, no, listen, guys, please feel me. These are first world problems. I totally understand. But it just, it's not fair. Verse 1, chapter 14. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under the pomegranate tree which is in Migran. The people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, but the people did not know that Jonathan was gone. Now I can go into the whole discussion. If you guys don't know what an ephod is, look it up if you have questions about it. The priest, you guys remember Ichabod? Ichabod, we talked about. That means the glory is gone. Uh, you remember when Eli fell off the chair because the Ark of the Covenant was found and one of, one of Eli's sons, his wife was pregnant. She, he got killed also. She gave birth and she said, just name him Ichabod. Well, he grows up apparently now he's a priest and he's wearing an ephod. Now, ephod was a vest that had these little uh, stones in it. And if you wanted to do something, it was almost like, you guys know what a, a magic eight ball is? Am I going to get the girl? Put it by your chin. Yes, I think so. Woo! You know what I mean? That's almost like what an ephod was. It had stones, and, he, and he'd pull the stones out, and he'd literally read the stones. But this was of the Lord. This was of the Lord. So he's wearing an ephod. Jonathan decided, takes his armor bearer, the guy carries his sword and some of his stuff. You know, when, back in the day, you had to have an armor bearer because not only did you have a, a suit of iron on or a suit of some kind of protection, whether it be thick leather or not, but... You needed arrows. You needed different parts of your equipment. You had a guy that would hold that for you. And he's standing back of you. And when you're shooting an arrow, he'd hand you another one. Or you, you, you lose your, your dagger, he'd hand you another dagger. So you couldn't carry all that stuff with you. You didn't have like that whole Batman belt thingy. Batman belt's cool. Let's go up there. Let's see what God does. Let's... Let's do something crazy. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Boses, the name of the other, Sina. The front of one faced northward opposite Michmash and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Now apparently there's these rocks that are in formations like kind of like this and it's almost like a, a continued upward plane. And they're kind of at the bottom or maybe they're at the top looking down. It really doesn't... But apparently there's something with this terrain that's a little bit difficult to, 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 to um, transfer on, to tra traverse on. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. What a different attitude than the rest of Israel. What a different attitude than his father. Hey, let's see if God wants to do something. Let's see if God wants... Because if God wants to rescue us, <laughs> what have we seen Him do? If God wants this to go down, then it'll go down. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that's in your heart. Go then. Here, I am with you according to your heart. Man, I love this armor bearer. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up there, up to them. But if we say to them, Thus come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So, apparently, they, they, they see them, 
And they say, what we'll do is we'll start climbing between these rocks. If they see us, they can, and if they say, come on up, we got a little something, something for you. Or if they say, hey, we're going to come down and get you. We'll know what God wants us to do. They set out this test. They set out this fleece. They took a step of faith out on the water. You guys understand? Interesting story. Verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. The Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes and where they've hidden. You guys remember they were in the holes? Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor and said, hey, come up here. We got something to show you. We got a little something, something for you. Come on up here, you circumcised. <laughs> Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. That's faith right there. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan as he, as he came after him. His armor bearer killed them. Then first, that first, the slaughter which Jonathan's armor bearer made was about 20 men within a half acre land. So they're climbing up this thing between the rocks. And as the guys are coming down, Jonathan would hit him. Boom! Armor bearer would stare. Another one. Boom! Da! Going downhill would seem a lot easier than going uphill, but for whatever reason, God delivered them into their hand. And he said they crawled about a half an acre of land. You guys have that as a visual. And they killed about 20 guys just in that rough terrain that they were engaging on. And they were trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. Now listen, give me attention. It takes such a little faith. The Lord Jesus said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, be thou removed and be cast into... In your life, it just... Step out. It takes so little, man. Here they are. They stepped out. Do you see it? And now, God started to move heaven and earth, man. He made the ground shake, or at least they thought the ground was shaken. And now, instead of 30,000 people going, Kill the Israelites! Kill! <laughs> They're coming out of the ground! They're everywhere! Okay. You remember? You remember what God did when, when they went through Egypt? Oh, oh, remember what God... Now all of a sudden, fear grips their heart. Because God can do that stuff, man. God can do that stuff. There's no men left in all this. This church is too small. My husband's heart. My, uh, this girl. Hey, stop! What's too hard for God? Just believe. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah, verse 16, of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. I love that verse. They started looking. Listen again. Listen again. The watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away. Now remember, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they left. We don't know how far away they are, but apparently there was these watchmen that were still in Gibeah with Saul. And they're watching the battle. What's going on? I don't know what's going on, but the Philistines are melting away. Much like our problems when we give them to the Lord. And they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people with him, Now call the roll to see who has gone from us. Remember, because he, he, he numbered the people, which is a big no-no to God. Because like John, here you got one guy saying, Count the people. There's 600 with us. What happened to the other 1,800 or whatever it was? They split. They're in a hole. They're in a bush. They're in a cave. Yes, we need to know how many, because if we count the numbers, and we have more than them, but then look at his son, though. What's to stop the Lord from helping us whether we're many or few? You see that? Call the roll. Find out who's missing. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, it was Jonathan and his armor bearer who were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, bring the ark of God here. For at that time, the ark was with the children of Israel. You guys remember, we've talked all about the ark of the covenant, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and here now, again, superstition kicks in. It's not enough that God's with them. You know what? Get the ark, because if the ark's here, we'll be safe. 
You see the difference in the two men? Both doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason. Saul is more superstitious than religious. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they withdrew and they went to battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor. And there was a very great confusion. Give me your attention. Saul says to the priest, Withdraw your hand out of the ephod. Should we go to battle? Should we not go to battle? Go to battle. Yes! The Lord is with us! Now, Saul didn't know, or maybe he did know, he wasn't with him because of Saul. The Lord was about to do something miraculous, and guess what? It didn't matter who didn't believe, because it was who believed that was important. That's huge, guys. God's never going to work with me because my husband doesn't believe this. God's never going to work with me because my wife... Did. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if your kids don't believe in Jesus. You believe in Jesus. You believe, and you keep praying for them, and you watch God do a good... Oh, but God can't... God can! Your faith... Your faith is what will work. You with me? Amen. Now he also says that there was great confusion. Let me explain to you what happened. God freaked these... Is now watch. What they thought was their strength became their weakness. There was 20 some odd thousand. Who knew how many thousand people? They thought it was a great thing, right? Well, guess what? The Israelites are coming out of the rocks. They're coming out of the pits. They're coming out of the caves. Now the Philistines think the Israelites are everywhere. So guess what they started doing? Killing each other. Ah, there's an Israelite. Oh, darn, that was a Philistine. Ah, there's a... Boom, confusion in the camp. Now what they thought was their greatest strength now became their greatest weakness because there was confusion amongst them. See how God can turn things around like that? Verse 21, Moreover, the Hebrews with the Philistines before at that time who went up with them into the camp for the surrounding country and also joined the Israelites who had Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim when they had heard that the Philistines fled, that they also followed hard with, after them in battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle shifted to Beth Let me explain to you what happened. Some of the Israelites at this time were kind of hanging out with the uh, Philistines. Hey, you know what? Some people go with the winners. Right now, the Philistines are looking like the winners. So let's hang out with them. You know kind of, kind of people I'm talking about. Some of us were like that. How many of you guys are Jet fans? How many of you guys are Dolphin fans? How many of you guys have changed now from Jet and Dolphin fans to Denver fans? <laughs> there you go. There you go. See? There's one of them. Proof positive. Everybody likes a winner. Say again? Well, then you didn't change, did you? Or you just, you just heard Denver and were like, yes, I heard he said Denver. He said Denver. I heard him say Denver. That's all that matters. So what happens is, there's confusion. They start killing each other and the Israelites start going... Let's go back to the other side. And then those that were in the cave and they're sticking out, here's what happened. He's like, ready? <laughs> Guys, I think, I think the Philistines are getting beat up. What? No way. Yeah, no. Serious. I, I, I've seen, yeah, because I see the Hebrews. I, I saw them. They're all coming out. And, and, and the Philistines are running away. Maybe we should come out of the cave. No, no, let's, yeah, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, Hebrews were popping up out of the ground. <laughs> Any idea where I was? Yes, all the way at the bottom. Verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under no, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, because I have taken vengeance until I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Now what happens is the Israelites start winning. Saul says, Listen, we're going to win this battle. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to win this battle. I want everybody in the camp to fast. Nobody eat nothing until every single Philistine is dead. 
Isaiah chapter 58 says, is this the fast that I've called? Again, he's doing this in the hopes of being religious. But it's superstition. Do you understand? The Bible says, do not muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain. Do anybody know what that is? Do not muzzle the ox while he treads out the grain. Practically speaking, this is a two-fold um, verse here. The, the application is, when you are plowing a field, you're plowing the field, and the ox is going, and he's got, he's got this machine with him that cuts all the grain down. And every once in a while, the ox would reach over, grab a mouthful of grain, and start eating it while he was plowing. Some people, they'd put a muzzle. I don't want that ox eating my grain. He'll eat his own grain. The Bible says don't do that. Let the ox eat while he's working. It's the same thing. Some people that are at church, they work at a church, they're in ministry. Listen to me. Don't overburden. That's the verse that, that, that my board gave me to take. Listen to me. You've got to start taking some money. I don't want to take I made God a promise. Listen, you made a promise to God that we're not going to keep with you. If you're going backwards, you are muzzling the ox while he's treading out the grain. That's why when we put Austin and Elena on cleaning up the church. No, no, we don't want to get paid. No, no, listen. Don't muzzle the ox. You guys, you guys have a house. You got to... When we have... Um, Julia, thank you. Ooh. Julia, who does the books. Oh, I'll do it for free. No, 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 no. These, these people aren't wealthy people. No, no. You got to have a little something. This, your time is valuable. Now, there is a time to donate your time. Absolutely a time to, to sow in faith. And you'll reap in greatness. You'll reap in faith and so on. But this is not. He called a fast because he called a fast. You can read Isaiah 58 and also the things in, all through Matthew where the Lord talks about fasting and what it's for. This was not it. Continuing though. Um, 25? Now all the people of the land came to a forest and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was honey dripping, but no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. So here they're going through the woods, and they're touching the trees and the ground, and, and there's honey. Apparently it's either sap or something like that. And oh, they're like, oh. If Saul found out, you'd be dead. But Jonathan had not heard his father's charge for the people with an oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of his rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his countenance brightened. You ever drink something, eat something that just immediately it's like, guys, if you're ever in a really bad mood or you have a kid in a really bad mood, especially teenagers, give them something to eat before you beat them. Because you don't know. Sometimes a meal can change a whole, change a whole attitude. So, I mean, this happens all the time. My son, he's 16, just turned 16. And sometimes he's just acting 16. You know, and he's like, have you eaten anything today? Well, do me a favor. Go get something to eat, and then let's talk again. And if you're still in the same mood, then I'll beat you. <laughs> sometimes you're just, you're down and you're depressed. And man, sometimes you just need a good meal. So just, just eat something. Here he dips his hand in, he dips the stick in, he pulls it up. And, oh my goodness, that's what I needed. He just killed people, he'd just been in a battle. Who knows how? Yes! Then one of people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. Oh my goodness. They were afraid of this big king. Oh my, that's his son. I mean, Jonathan certainly wouldn't kill his son, would he? But Jonathan, I mean, Saul wouldn't kill his son Jonathan, would he? But Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance is brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies when they found. For now, there would not have been much, there would have been, a, you know what I mean. He says, my father has made a mistake. He troubled the land. He said what the people should have done is after they killed the Philistines in this town, they should have slaughtered them and eaten here. There would have been a great slaughter. You can't have muzzle the ox while he's treading the grain. These people have been in battle. They were faint and trembling. Seven days they were in it. Do you guys remember now? Now, they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. 
So the people were very faint, and the people rushed up on the spoil, took sheep, oxen, and calves, and slaughtered them on the ground. And the people ate them with the blood. And they told Saul, look, the people are sinning against the Lord by eating with the blood. Please give me your attention. Very specific with Scripture, you don't boil the meat of a goat in the blood of the mother. That's why today Jews never drink milk when they eat food. They think that that's like boiling. Listen, you also, there's another scripture in Leviticus that don't eat um, blood, don't boil the blood and don't eat the blood of the, don't boil in the milk and don't eat the blood, according to Levitical law. Here, John is just kill and eat, guys. Eat. My father messed up. Eat. They're killing the food. They're eating it. Oh, but with the blood. Again, Saul, he's got the right heart, but he's got the wrong reason. He's trying to follow the law, but the spirit. The Bible says that the law brings death. The spirit gives life. And I can do a whole next half hour on the difference between the law and why Christ is... Christ is the New Testament. The Old Testament is the law. The new covenant. So he said, verse 33, end of it, you have dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. Then Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me here every man's ox and every man's sheep. Slaughter them here and eat and do not sin against the Lord by eating with blood. So every one of the people brought his ox with him that night and slaughtered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first altar that he had built to the Lord. Now Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light and let us not leave a man of them. So, nightfall, Saul has a change of heart. Bring your rocks here. Let's, if we're going to eat, let's do this the right way. They go and they have their big barbecue. You guys are with me. I know I'm going long. Stay with me. I'm going to roll to the end soon. Now Saul said, let us go to Philistines by night. I said that. Now Saul said, let us go to Philistines by night and plunder them until the morning light and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, let us draw near to God here. So Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him in that day. Now, if you're praying about something, guys, and you're wondering what to do, know this. God says one of three things. One, he says no. Two, he says yes. Three, he says keep praying. Notice he asked the he told the priest, I want you to do the whole stone thing again. No answer. He said, I'm not going to do that. Saul said, verse 38, come over here, all your chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives, who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Give me your attention before we finish this. He says, moving on. And you're going to notice this is a pattern of, of, of Saul's life. It's a pattern of some of our lives. When we don't get the answer we want from God, we just keep going anyway. We ask God to give us an answer, but some of us ask God to give the answer we like. So he goes right from not hearing the voice of God to saying, okay, who was it now yesterday that I said not to eat and they ate? Even if it's my son Jonathan, he dies now. Continuing. But not a man among the people answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You be on one side, and my son Jonathan and I will be on the other side. And the people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. So the people wouldn't tell, John, wouldn't tell Saul who it was that, that told them to eat. You see what he says there? He says, Okay, all you on one side, me and Jonathan will stand here. Therefore Saul said to the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. So Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. And Saul said, Cast lots between my son Jonathan and me. So Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you've done. This is crazy. It's like drawing straws. He gives straws, and he cuts a few of them in half, and he gives them to all the people. And the people who pick the short straws... 
That's how they know that's the guilty party. Guess who picked the short straws? Jonathan and Saul. And Saul doesn't realize you're as guilty as him. This is the Lord. This is, goodness is so much here, guys. I wish we could spend days on this. Be careful. I heard it put in English like this. When you point your finger at somebody else, you got three pointing right back at you. You guys heard that? Here, who picked the short straw? Him and Jonathan. Like, instead of, oh, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, forgive me. No, he's going to continue. You're just as guilty as him according to your own lots that you just drew. You understand? So much more to say. <clears throat> verse, uh, the, the, the latter part of verse 43, and Jonathan told him and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, so now I must die. <laughs> Jonathan told him, right, where's that? You know what? I told him. I tasted it, and then I told him, kill me. Go ahead, do it. I'm ready to die. If that's your judgment, Father, you do it. Do your, do your worst. Saul answered, God do so, and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. <laughs> nice daddy, huh? But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die who has accomplished his great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of the head of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan and did not die. First thing happens, and it's of the Lord. Listen, for you guys, I've got to take a second. If you think that your king is crazy, if you think that your boss is crazy, if you think that your husband is whack, if you think that whoever it is that is in leadership over your life is out of his mind, is wrong, is doing something bad, is doing something against the Lord, get a pen and write this down. A Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards. A Tale of Three Kings by... Nobody's writing, so everybody must be in good shape. A Tale of Three Kings. You have to read this book. It's an hour read. One hour you could read this whole book, and I guarantee you it will change your life. It is the story of King Saul, of King David, and of another, another son of David named Absalom. And it will change the way. Now what you have here is an immediate insurrection. You will die, Jonathan. Now all of a sudden the insurrection starts. The people go, listen, you're not killing him. Immediately the king, now all the people will, will gather again. No, you're not killing him. He just delivered us. This whole thing, this whole defeat of... of you're going to kill the man that started this? It's not going to happen. You will not have one hair on his head. Now again, do you see any repentance? Watch what happens. Then Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. It didn't say he repented. didn't say he changed his mind. Nothing. He just keeps on going forward. No repentance, no repentance, no repentance. Now this we've talked about a lot. The longer you think you're okay with God when you sin, the bigger problem you got. We sin so many times. We do something really bad, and we look at it and go, well, God's not punishing me. God must be okay with it. So Saul established his sovereignty over Israel and fought against all the enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them. And he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan, Jeshuai, and Malkishua, Malkishua. And the names of his two daughters were these. The names of the firstborn was Marib, and the name of the youngest, Michal. The name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaz. The name of the commander of his army was Abner, the son of Nir, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Nir was, the, was of Abner, the son of Abiel. Now there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or valiant man, he took him for himself. Give me your attention. Here's where we finish. 
little history about Saul. He just tells you where it is. Saul was a great leader. A great leader. And Saul, even though he was no longer walking with God, God still used him to defeat the enemies. We're about to see another man come into the picture over the next few verses that the Bible says had a, had a heart after God. The story of Saul is one of the saddest in all Scripture. It's a man that could have been great. And as a minister, somebody who's been in the church for 20 plus years, you see people with potential and it gets wasted. There's nothing sadder. When you see somebody like Saul who has all the gifts in the world and not the brokenness, it's horrible. There's nothing sadder. I encourage you to take the things, reread this last two chapters, see what you can pull out and apply to your life. I'm sorry I had to take a long time and doing a lot, and there's so much more in these chapters to, to read. I, I encourage you to, to read them on your own and, and to consider them in prayer. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the the wisdom of your word and the, and the power of your word. Thank you, God, for the, and the lessons of your word. May we find ourselves straddled up on the, on the mountain. May we find ourselves also with faith like Jonathan to know that you can deliver. God, may we find ourselves, no matter what, what is looking us in the eye, may we find ourselves looking at it right back. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for, God, the, the rebuke of your word, the things that you said to us today that we knew, that's for us. God, may we, may we not spit it out, but may we swallow it whole and allow your seed to root into our heart. God, we love you and thank you. Have your way in and through us. May we do May we be exactly where you've called us to. And may we know that joy, God. Help us, please. We need you more than ever. In Christ's name, amen.